we can start now. Thank you. It's over to you. Um, I like to um, situate Russia's attack on Ukraine in the context of an emerging bipolarity in international relations that is different from the bipolarity of the Cold War. And I'm thinking of democracies versus autocracies. Uh, the Economist, uh, in its preview of the world in uh, 2022, said that this is a major trend to watch. The rivalry that will play out in virtually everything. I also want to uh, uh, call to your attention an article by Anne Applebaum in the Atlantic in November last year, entitled, The Bad Guys Are Winning. And there she coined the term autocracy incorporated. Now let me quote at some length from that article. Nowadays, autocracies are run not by one bad guy, but by sophisticated networks composed of kleptocratic financial structures, security services, and professional propagandists. The members of these networks are connected not only within a given country, but among many countries. The corrupt state-controlled companies in one dictatorship do business with corrupt state-controlled companies in another. The police in one country can arm, equip, and train the police in another. The propagandists share resources. The troll farms that promote one dictator's propaganda can also be used to promote the propaganda of another. And themes pounding home the same messages about the weakness of democracy and the evil of America. End of quote. The leading states of Autocracy Incorporated China and Russia are united in their front against Western democracies. Xi Jinping and Putin have had 37 video meetings, according to Chinese media, and they met, as you know, in person uh, during the Olympic Games in Beijing. In one, in connection with one of there are meetings uh, in December last year, she said, and I quote again, certain international forces under the guise of democracy and human rights uh, are interfering in the internal affairs of China and Russia. While the two countries do not have any formal alliance, she has assured Putin that, and I quote again, in its closeness and effectiveness, the relationship even exceeds an alliance. At the other pole in this bipolarity, uh, President Biden convened world leaders from government, civil society, and the private sector uh, in the first ever virtual summit for democracy on 9 to 10 December last year. In his opening speech, Biden called the defense of democracy against authoritarianism, and again, I quote, the defining challenge of our time. This meeting attracted fairly little media attention, but the follow-up scheduled for later this year will probably have increased significance. I think that it is, is against this backdrop we should see Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. Members of Autocracy Incorporated have tended to be impervious to international criticism. Putin, for one, has gone beyond merely ignoring foreign criticism to outright mocking it. In his view, which has now proven disastrously wrong, the Western world, Europe in particular, consists of enfeebled democracies 
run by weaklings, feminists, queers, and drug addicts. <laughs> the strong response by Western these enfeebled Western democracies has not only taken Putin by surprise, but has also elevated China to the leadership of autocracy incorporated and made Russia increasingly dependent on China. We have to remember that in economic terms, China is a heavyweight. Russia is a wounded flyweight. The Russian political scientist Vladimir Gelman, he's also uh, he, uh, he's a professor at Helsinki University. He has called Putin's decision to invade Ukraine the worst decision any Russian leader has ever made. Well, that says a lot. <laughs> um, the decision builds on grave miscalculations and has proven to be counterproductive. In military terms, Putin obviously expected a short operation, a Ukrainian surrender, and then he could replace President Zelensky. There is an indication of that on the Saturday after the invasion, two days after the invasion, uh, the state's news agency Novosti uh, uh, released an obviously pre-written article claiming that Ukraine had returned to Russia and that there would no longer be any anti-Russian Ukraine. The article was quickly withdrawn, but it has been noted. In the drawn out fighting on the ground, Putin has overestimated his own forces. That is obvious. He has sent in young soldiers, unprepared, not even sometimes knowing where they are. Maintenance and support logistics have been totally inadequate. The 60 kilometer long convoy on the way to Kyiv has been stalled for days at end. At the same time, he has underestimated uh, uh, the uh, Ukrainian defense. He has underestimated the role of motivation and the role of the knowledge of terrain in territorial defense. That's the military side, but it's also miscalculated the political response. He obviously overestimated the extent of pro-Russian sentiments in Ukraine. He saw, well, his view of Zelensky was that of a, an impopular, incompetent former comedian. He has now metamorphosed, uh, metamorphosed into a respected statesman. He could not foresee either that Ukraine is winning the information war, or the propaganda war, if you want to call it that. Winning over Putin's blatant, very often ludicrous lies primarily, of course, aimed at the domestic audience, but they make Orwell's newspeak and thought police look pale. NATO was weakened by controversies. It has emerged more united than ever. Even Finland and Sweden are considering membership these days. Uh, the EU 
where Russia has tried to sow dissension and foment internal conflicts. Uh, now, by uh, with the invasion, by contrast, uh, have, it has triggered an extraordinary degree of unity in, in the European Union. And then you can see individual countries with with a lot of change. Uh, I mean, Germany for the first time is providing military assistance and is has uh, announced a, a substantial increase in its defense budget. Switzerland is abandoning its sacred bank secrecy. Poland is welcoming refugees with open arms. It's obvious that Putin expected economic sanctions to be much weaker. And on the basis of previous experiences, he thought that the flow of refugees would lead to disunity among the Western democracies. In all this, he's been totally wrong miscalculated totally. There is a remaining weakness among our Western democracies, especially in Europe. Europe's dependence on Russian oil and gas is, uh, is a major factor. Also, sanctions don't reach the laundered, dirty Russian money in the global financial system. And I understand that we're talking about substantial amounts of, of money. Now, then, what will be the outcome of all this? Well, first, we hear about chilling presidents, Grozny, Aleppo, where Soviet arms have eradicated whole cities. And the question is, is Kiev next? I would say hopefully not. And the hope that uh, I would point to is that Kiev has a historic symbolic significance as the cradle of the Russian Empire, Russian civilization. So, so the destruction of Kiev would affect emotionally, I think, many ordinary Russians uh, as well. Is occupation then the the uh, uh, option? Ukraine covers a very large. Uh, land area. Occupation would lead to, uh, uh, as we can see with the resistance these days, to partisan sabotage, guerrilla warfare. Uh, there is no way the occupying power would be welcomed in, in uh, Ukraine. Can you put a uh, Russian puppet or quisling uh, at, at the uh, power in, in, in Kiev? There has been talk about the much hated former uh, president Viktor Yanukovych. Um, it would only make matters worse, I think. The question is also, is Putin prepared to go further than Ukraine? Our, as far as I see, Moldova is extremely vulnerable. Um, we have Georgia, Armenia. He's even made threats to Sweden and Finland because of our military assistance to Ukraine. The common denominator here is countries which do not enjoy alliance protection. Mediation. There are people like uh, Macron, Erdogan, the Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, who 
tried to make mediation efforts. Frankly, I think they are hopeless. Um, you cannot mediate between a fire and the fire brigade. You cannot mediate between a criminal and the victim. I think the, the only possible way that I see is to induce China to put pressure on Russia, because Russia, as I said, is extremely dependent now on Chinese support. And China has a, had a rather equivocal reaction to the invasion. It did it abstained in the Security Council uh, vote rather than going with Russia. Uh, it uh, says that uh, Ukraine is a sovereign state. It has called for end, the end of fighting and diplomacy. So what uh, Scholz and Macron and others uh, are doing, uh, which we don't hear much about, and I think that is a good sign, uh, could uh, probably be more effective than, than so-called mediating uh, efforts. Um, because the, the uh, sad truth is that if Russia stops fighting, there will be no more war. If Ukraine stops fighting, there will be no more Ukraine. In any event, both countries are losers. Personally, I see no end to this madness short of Putin's removal from power one way or another. Now, one can also speculate about the long-term consequences of all this. The first one is a certain one. <laughs> Russia is becoming an international pariah. A European North Korea. It will be very difficult to be a Russian and move around in the world. I think you can compare it to being a German right after the end of the World War II. It will take time. It also raises the question, what can we do to promote a democratic Russia in the future? Previous efforts after the fall of the wall didn't succeed. Uh, Ivan Krastev, the political scientist, has, has shown that, um, I mean, Democracy was imposed from the outside. It rested on imitation rather than conviction. So what can we do? I think that is a, a, a very big question for the future. We could also start asking us, ourselves, what will be the impact on populist politicians in the West who have before being close in various ways to Putin. Uh, Marine Le Pen and Orban both face elections this year. It'll be very interesting to see what effect uh, this war will have. And of course, in 2024, the, the presidential election in the United States, how will it affect Trump or a Trump clone entering the, the presidential campaign? One also wonders about the impact on the relations between China and Taiwan. Uh, I am there are pessimists there who say that this will um, now.
China uh, will learn from Russia and take over uh, Taiwan. I don't think so. I, I don't think this encourages uh, a Chinese military operation, seeing what, what has happened to Putin. And uh, beyond that, I mean, Taiwan uh, has a very uh, mountainous, difficult terrain, and there is a lot of Taiwanese capital in China, especially in the Shanghai area. A lot of China, uh, Taiwanese investments. So um, I, I, I don't see uh, that danger as as acute. And then there, there is no way you can't mention climate change. In the midst of, of, of uh, this mess, the UNC, UNCC released a, an ar alarming report uh, on the state of affairs. The uh, OSCE, uh, the Organization for uh, Security and Cooperation in Europe, last year had a resolution where they're called climate change a um, threat multiplier. It affects security in, in various ways, and, and the war does not help. Uh, and Russia's whole existence hinges on fossil fuel. Uh, if you are an optimist, you could turn the threat multiplier around and hope that uh, efforts in Europe to reduce the reliance on uh, Russian oil and gas will accelerate investments in renewable and sustainable energy sources. But that's uh, the hope of an optimist. Well, to go uh, back to where I started with the bipolarity, I think what is happening underscores the need for unity among democracies. I think it also demonstrates and reveals the shortcomings of political decision making in autocracies. Let me remind you uh, of, of my late mentor and good friend Alex George, who uh, wrote uh, a piece on the role of devil's advocates in uh, decision, executive decision making. You need someone to question, uh, to ask uncomfortable questions about what seems the evident way to go forward. And in democracies, we have built in devil's advocates. It's institutionalized in democracies. In autocracies, like in Putin's case, there are no devil's advocates to question what, what he is doing, and that is unfortunate. Well, thank you for listening. Slava Ukraini. I believe some of you are muted. Just maybe check your mic, professors. I was muted. Slava Ukraina. Thank you very much, Krister, uh, for your wonderful presentation. And I would like to open a roundtable discussion and let's keep it informal. Uh, please uh, just raise your hand if you if you want to say something and and uh, Damien will, will see to it that you get your voice because I might just mute somebody by mistake. So thank you again, uh, Christer. This was very enlightening. Uh, I felt maybe if I may just say that you might be a little bit too optimistic um, because of, uh, you know, there is also the aspect of Putin being, I think, rather unstable uh, individual who might just feel too pressured to and might do something quite dramatic. Uh, we don't want to go there, but 
but that possibility does exist in some to some extent. So thank you and please feel free to comment. Hands up. Uh, Philip, I mean. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I, I really enjoyed listening to you as always. Uh, very clear and uh, cutting through to the, the core of the matter. Uh, I, uh, I appreciate this idea of the bipolar world developing uh, struggle between democracy and autocracy. What, I, what I'm a little bit less uh, enthusiastic about or uh, positive about is the unity uh, amongst the Western uh, democracies. Uh, I'm not speaking about the international unity uh, between the leaders of these states. I'm a bit more concerned about the fault lines running through these societies uh, themselves, specifically related to uh, growing inequalities in many of these countries. Uh, the fact that some, some believe that uh, governments are not doing enough to address the problems of rising inequality also of uh, increasing poverty among certain population groups. Um, it struck me that the German government can find overnight 100 billion to spend on defense, uh, but when it comes to increasing uh, social spending, we have all kinds of arguments that we shouldn't run budget deficits and all. That type of argument, I think, is undermining the uh, solidarity within Western democracies. And uh, why I hope, while I hope that uh, international solidarity will be strong enough to withstand uh, Putin and others like him, I'm just a little bit concerned over the longer term about the unity or the solidarity within Western societies. Thank you very much. Uh, Krista, would you like to comment? No, I agree. I mean, the, the, that is, uh, it's not only, uh, as you say, the unity vis-a-vis uh, -vis autocracies, but it's also, uh, you have to somehow demonstrate the uh, superiority of democracy. Uh, and um, unless you, you, you uh, I mean, if, if you cannot uh, satisfy the whole demos, uh, you have a problem, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Dirk? Well, I think it was an excellent summary of the major events and of, of, of the last two weeks and the well, preceding uh, situation. And uh, I think most people, as, as Christa pointed out, um, and Putin himself. He overestimated himself, he underestimated the reactions. And uh, in, in this respect, I, I think a qualified optimism may be justified. But as Ursula hinted at, uh, what Christa did not mention is a so-called nuclear option. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a long time, Putin has been perceived, and he possibly considered himself to be a, a cool, rational chess player, calculating all his moves in advance and perceiving his opponent's moves in advance. But what, what we have seen now is uh, the opposite. He is a person uh, just by himself. He is, well, as Krista pointed out, he does, or and, and and Philip, he doesn't follow or doesn't get any outside advice. Um, he secluded himself, and he f is following a vision, or you may call it an illusion, of Greater Russia or Nova Russia. And in this way, he is behaving out of our normal. Mm. Well, calculus and 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 uh, judgments, and so this latent danger is still there, and uh, well, it's of course a, a reason of concern for all of us. The crucial question is, and this will take time, and maybe Velo is better in a position 
to judge this. Uh, how the longer term reactions in Russia will turn out. For the time being, it looks like Putin is still on the safe side, at least in the, in the, in the countryside and among the elderly and many other groups and the mm -hmm. uh, uh, Christian Orthodox Church uh, as represented by, by uh, Bishop Kirill in, in Moscow. But um, this will take time and there it's difficult to judge what will happen when. So, so far, we just are constraining him. And uh, as Christa pointed out, the unity on the European side, on the NATO side, and the worldwide reactions as manifested in the uh, UN assembly and, and elsewhere are, are remarkable. So this is all on, on, on the positive side. What, what nobody here and anywhere else will be able to predict what is actually going to happen. Maybe a small remark on the German reactions. This was also entirely or mostly unexpected. This very rapid and decisive action by our new government. It's called the Ampel Coalition, meaning the traffic light coalition, uh, consisting of the red, the social democrats, yellow, yellow the liberals, and green, well, the green ecological party. And um, <coughs> almost overnight, Scholz put up his ideas and he tried to get support for it. And there was widespread support in parliament at a special session on, on that, that Sunday <coughs> following the, the invasion. Uh, which had never had happened before, such a special session, and the major opposition party expressed full support for for that program. So again, this is part of the miscalculation. Uh, but that's all I'm afraid we can say for the time being. Taiwan, China <laughs> remains another question. So the, the weights are different, of course, and the sizes of the uh, opponents could concern, but China, I think, is, is learning uh, what, what is happening there. Maybe just a light note a, a, at the end. The term ampel, traffic light, means robot in South Africa. And you talk about robots. And Scholz yeah. has had this nickname to be a robot or a Scholz format because of his way of talking. So a robot has become a double meaning nowadays, but this is just a side <laughs> remark. Thank you very much, Dirk. Uh, Hans Dieter, you raised your hand, as I thought, and your mic is muted. Your mic is muted. You hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let me join uh, uh, in Dirk's praise of your clear analytical uh, talk and uh, analysis of the situation. Uh, <clears throat> I think we are all agreed uh, uh, in our moral reaction to what uh, uh, has happened and uh, we are all sad and angry. However, I think one problem will not go away. I think we need a discussion about uh, the new security order that we should have in Europe. And that uh, new security order will not be had, had without the Russians. So I think uh, a, a constructive uh, a dialogue, uh, which we badly need, because, uh, you know, if we uh, just uh, make a statement that we cannot talk any longer, then we have reached a certain end. The discussion on a peace order or a security uh, uh, order uh, that includes the Russians and maybe also the Chinese. This is what should be tackled. And I think uh, it has nothing to do with uh, uh, evaluating uh, Putin's uh, uh, actions positively. But uh, what we have seen is the breakdown of a, a, a security 
uh, order which includes not the NATO, but that includes uh, the Russian as a counterpart. And, uh, and this is something which we should not forget uh, in our discussions. Thank you very much. I would just like to want, say one thing. Uh, perhaps, uh, Christa, you want to answer? You want to comment? Well, uh, first of all, um, I, I'm, I agree that uh, we uh, we have to include the Russians. Uh, let's forget about Putin, uh, although it's hard to do. There are a number of things uh, on the uh, on social media, like uh, don't speak to Russian, to, to Putin, speak to the Russians and so forth. Um, this, uh, there are a number of Nordic newspapers that from today, they are translating uh, their, uh, uh, their um, uh, newspaper, they're reporting from Ukraine uh, to Russian. Uh, on on the internet, uh, I mean to get uh, there with social media and, and and the internet and so forth. There should be possibilities to reach out to to uh, to Russians. Uh, that that is one way to go. But I think um, to get rid of Putin uh, takes. Uh, I mean, he has a very narrow circle of advisors and so-called friends and and yes, sayers. Uh, if they get together, I mean, it's it's not a large thing if they get together and say, no, this guy has gone too far. They can oust him, especially if they get support by the military and the military I think uh, th there are several signs of dissatisfaction within the Russian uh, military the way things are going because this does not look like a professional military operation designed by military specialists. Uh, and they are dissatisfied. There was one uh, very prominent uh, uh, Russian military uh, uh, retired, but the uh, chair of a, a, a veterans organization that war who warned against uh, uh, an invasion before it uh, it happened, and he did so openly and. Of course, he couldn't do that unless he had some support from inside the, the, the military machine and so forth. So I, in the in the shorter run, uh, the hope is really uh, for someone to um, kick this kick Putin out um, one way or the other. But in the long run, there is a lot of work to do with a population, large population that has been seriously misled for years and years. Thank you. Uh, Laurent? Well, on that last point, I agree. But uh, <clears throat> I mean, we've observed in quite a lot of conflicts the way the national leader becomes uh, more popular, at least temporarily, when the nation is under threat. Uh, there is some data from Russia suggesting that before this happened, he had about 45 percent and that now he has about 60 percent support. How long that will last when the full consequences will come through, I don't know. But it's not just the repression of the protesters that's uh, doing it. He also does have, um, uh, rightly or wrongly, he has some support he can fall back on. And, you know, I remember the way Nixon had support in the United States for what he did in Vietnam. And you kept thinking, surely that's going to erode. And it took a long time if it ever did. Uh, and we can go on. I can think of other wars as well. 
Um, on Hans Dieter's very important point about the security situation, um, or the security dimension, Russia and America are major nuclear powers who will never cease to be major nuclear powers, whoever governs them. And whoever is the ruler of Russia or America has their finger on the button. And we have to hope that they act with a responsible and um, sane um, outlook. Uh, interestingly, uh, I, th I forget who it was. I think it was, uh, there was, there was a, a recent interview with uh, an American filmmaker who had interviewed Putin. Uh, I think it was Oliver Stone. And he'd shown Oliver Stone, uh, sorry, he, Oliver Stone had shown Putin the movie, which he hadn't previously seen, um, Dr. Strangelove. And Putin laughed and said, nothing changes, does it? Um, Dr. Strangelove, of course, was about an American ruler, not a Russian ruler. And um, we could have President Trump in 2024. I don't know whether we would think that this was a clear vindication of democracy over autocracy and of a, a clear triumph of uh, rationality and responsible government. I mean, I'd ask you, would you think that, that Trump was more reliable than Putin to be in charge of nuclear weapons? I'm not sure I would. Anyway, uh, and I actually think that for the most part, Putin is skillfully using uh, bluff to um, threaten and dis to appeal if you like, to public opinion, to um, back off from confronting him because he's mentioned nuclear weapons and everybody gets extremely um, personal when they think about nuclear weapons. Uh, I'm not sure whether he's doing that in an irrational way or whether that isn't exactly the, the, the madman theory, which used to be one of the um, props of American um, diplomatic uh, nuclear strategy as well. In any case, if the US and uh, Russia are, whatever happens, going to continue to be nuclear powers, what is going to be the lesson of this crisis for other countries that are wondering whether they should be nuclear powers or not? Um, for example, Belarus, uh, sorry, not Belarus, Ukraine had nuclear weapons in 1992. It voluntarily surrendered those nuclear weapons in 1993 in exchange for international guarantees that it's confirmed those guarantees. Looking back now, we see that if you don't have nuclear weapons, international guarantees aren't necessarily as watertight as all that. Mm. Um, I mean, Libya, Gaddafi gave up his attempt to have nuclear weapons and then he was defense. Well, he was then uh, uh, less of a threat and therefore, you know what happened to him. Um, right now, the Iranians are on the brink of either making a settlement which would slow down their acquiring nuclear weapons or not. It's absolutely in the balance this week and the Russians seem prepared to threaten the world with uh, sabotaging the, uh, the deal, uh, which would have the consequence, not good for Russia either, of speeding up the, 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 the pace at which Iran became a nuclear power. Although I think Iran is destined to become a nuclear power in due course anyway. Israel is a nuclear power and it's not tolerable really in the longer run for an Iranian government that Israel should have nuclear weapons and that uh, Iran should not. At any rate, uh, what I'm pointing out here is that uh, one of the dimensions which, if you like, unfortunately, um, will be more sharp, just as problems of climate change are not going to be simplified or eased by this war, 
problems of nuclear proliferation are certainly not going to be uh, eased by what has happened. Uh, the problem isn't going to go away. And the warning to all sorts of players that if you don't acquire nuclear weapons yourself, your sovereignty is always going to be at risk uh, from uh, other powers that are strong enough to encroach upon you, uh, is a warning which, uh, la regrettably, um, uh, has long-term and widespread global consequences. So I'm afraid that the proliferation implications of what's just happened are not good. Finally, um, uh, Lawrence, I have to soon interrupt you because I might go off in three minutes. So just quickly, please. Yeah, uh, Krista made a very interesting presentation, but I do want him to um, look at again and, and tell us which side he comes down on something where he gave two different opinions, really. Uh, his first was the emerging global bipolarity which emphasized that there was an axis of evil, which was China and Russia. And the second was the failure of well, China being rather equivocal and um, uh, Russia becoming more of a pariah. Uh, my own view is that it's very hard to achieve stable long-term commitment between autocracies because if you control every all the political forces inside your country in a ver vertical and intolerant way, how can you establish really trustworthy relationships with other partners that are durable and binding? Uh, so my my guess would be that uh, of the two, the, 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 rather than the guaranteed global bipolarity, we, we should be thinking more in terms of the second, the uh, tension between China uh, and Russia. Uh, a key question is, of course, what happened when Putin and Xi met together on the 6th of January, uh, February, and declared Putin and, 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 and uh, Xi declared uh, um, this was more than an alliance. This was a great historical partnership. Um, there are two possibilities, and there's really no way of avoiding the, choosing between them. Either Putin played Xi, or Xi knew what Putin was about to do. And we don't probably know which of those is the case. Although my own guess, because Putin didn't even tell his own close associates what he was going to do, and perhaps he hadn't even got it absolutely clear in his own mind. Perhaps he thought he was going to somehow get what he wanted in a very quick blitzkrieg and it wouldn't really catch. My own guess is that she didn't know what he'd let himself in for. And if that is so, the, the Chinese will have um, hesitated. The lesson they will draw from this is not favorable to um, a stable partnership with Putin or Moscow after that. That's enough from me, but I'd like to know what you think, Krista, on that. Can I uh, reply to that? Uh, well, uh, very interesting because, uh, yes, I mean, either either uh, uh, she knew there is, there is speculation that he even asked Putin uh, said, can't you wait until after the end of the, the uh, Olympic Games? Um, that's one possibility. The other one, as you said, he didn't know anything. Well, in the first case, if he knew and didn't tell the rest of the world, he's an accomplice uh, in, in, in this. Uh, he, if it was, as you guess, and I, that would be my guess as well, that he, that, uh, that uh, she didn't know that that of, of Putin's plans, then it was a uh, humiliation uh, of of of, uh, of she from Putin's side, really. And I think that uh, no, and and I think that is the what, your conclusion is uh, gives us some optimism, maybe. And uh, Applebaum is wrong about autocracy incorporated. 
maybe what we'll be seeing here is a new Sino-Soviet split. Uh, we have seen that in the past, of course, uh, uh, with serious consequences. Uh, and and uh, that could have serious consequences uh, in many ways, but it would also sort of take some of the uh, punch away from the autocracies because of the lack of unity. Have we lost Ursula? No, no, I think she's uh, gone off. Uh, electricity is cut off at five o'clock, yeah. I think. She's <laughs> off. Um, maybe we just follow the, the hands who are up, um, myself, and then Ebru is coming as well. I also have to leave soon for a family engagement, but um, uh, and, uh, seeing. Um, and I just wanted to, two points. One is about the Russian unity idea um, that, that Dirk referred to and, and, and others. Uh, it, it, in the context of our group, it, it's an interesting uh, test of the post-materialism thesis in that will Russians, when they're deprived of uh, their McDonald's and their H&M and, and uh, any of the other consumerist and materialist benefits that have perhaps raised their consciousness and raised their uh, emancipated values and a number of other things uh, over the course of the last 30 years, you know, will somehow seize the moment and try to defend those values and those materials, uh, goods and, 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 and the, that uh, wherewithal, or, or will it not? I mean, I, I think in that sense, it's uh, the not very uh, positive, it's not very an op optimistic outlook at the moment. Uh, people seem to be just going along with, with the suffering. And, and there's also the added effect of social media and of oligarchy in Russia that, that really has created a system that don't, uh, doesn't allow people to necessarily rise up if they feel deprived. But um, who knows, there, there might be some uh, breaking point. And then the other uh, point, um, it, we're, since we're talking about other people's work as well, uh, be it Anne Applebaum or others, um, uh, there's a, a um, who is it? There's an Israeli, uh, but also based in Texas, uh, historian, social scientist called Avizar Tucker, who made an interesting comparison uh, when we're talking about populists, and that was also the you know the future and even 2024, what will happen in the American election. Um, he brings a, a stark uh, comparison to 1968 and to Czechoslovakia and how uh, Euro communists were fundamentally, uh, you know, d completely discredited uh, by the Soviet invasion of, of Czechoslovakia. And therefore, uh, you know, to some degree, you can see populists as well uh, really having to backtrack uh, now on so many fronts. However, you know, the, it's, it is also clear that Euro communists had much more at stake in Moscow than the populists have in Moscow uh, today. Um, they, they, the populists in today's world stand on many legs and not just on one ideological, you know, motherland uh, or, 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 or center of gravity. Um, so in that sense, they're not going to disappear thanks to this invasion. But uh, it's, an, it's a thought-provoking thing for, I think, a lot of us who uh, will either remember 1968 or been close enough. I was born in that year, so at least I technically <laughs> qualify. Um, and uh, and that's, that's all that I'd like to add. Ibru, maybe you want to go on. Yeah, so, well, um, well, thank you very much, Chris. I'm afraid I, I just lost the major part of your talk. I was just in another meeting, so I, I just, um, you know, heard the last parts. But um, following the discussion, right, there are a couple of things that have been, like, crossing my mind since the last couple of days regarding, particularly in Turkey, there have been, like, a lot of, um, talks or analysis which are, you know, on Putin's personality and, um, you know, doing a little bit reading on populism and like the, the leadership. Um, I have a couple of thoughts. I don't know. I mean, these are just my observations. And there is this fascinating uh, article about Juliet Carbo, uh, you know, who has done more research on personalities. But um, I mean, there. I, I just want to share my observations related to um, some call them operational calls, some call them rationale of Putin's behaviors uh, over the last couple of weeks. And uh, one of them, 
uh, one of my observation is that uh, Putin over, I think it was 22 years since he is just uh, uh, being in politics. Uh, he has become a very powerful leader and um, and this made him like, a, you know, the poisoning, right? The power poisoning thing just occurred. So uh, apparently over the last years, um, he pays less attention to advisors or like the technocrats, um, particularly when it comes to foreign policy decisions. This is something that we have started observing uh, with this war in Syria. So, and this was also like after 2016 with the parliamentary elections, he has consolidated his power also in, in the domestic political sp spectrum. So uh, this is actually one of the reasons probably he, uh, like the traditional um, tools such as appeasement does not really work with him. I mean, all these sanctions that have been going on, uh, you know, that have been being implemented with the Western actors uh, since the beginning of the war, they don't seem to be really working, right? If you go back to 1938, the Munich conference, like appeasement and applying that appeasement strategy to Putin is apparently does not seem working. So it makes him more aggressive, right? In the way that he's, adopt a discourse to Ukraine, to West, to NATO, it becomes, I think, more and more, you know, focused on a hatred, a super disappointment from the Western actors, uh, even like saying Ukraine, there is no such a thing as Ukraine, no such a state as Ukraine. So there is just a huge, you know, sort of tendency to neglect. So he starts adapting and, you know, a discourse which is becoming much more negative. So I think what we need to understand when it comes to Putin's foreign policies over this last 22 years, we definitely need to keep in mind like what happened in the country. So um, like his connection with the oligarchs and there has been a super, you know, sanctions also to the oligarchs just to, you know, to attempt to stop put in uh, the war and it didn't actually, uh, be, you know, turn to be a successful strategy. So basically there is this, you know, power uh, sort of um, poisoning and this makes him adopt even a more populist approach when he addresses the domestic politics, right? He, I think, uh, and I don't know, I, I have not come across with any study in, in, in Russia uh, recently, like what the perceptions of the Russians on Putin, you know, and there is like a lot of qualitative, you know, um, s studies uh, on like how Putin is perceived. He is perceived to be like an indispensable person uh, in Russia. Of course, we can't like expand it like to the entire society, but you know, um, m m many people um, in these studies express that if there is no Putin, Russia will just disappear. So there, there, this is, I think, a quite a populist, you know, um, sort of leadership style. And uh, to understand his relation during the war with Russia, with with the Western world, uh, we have to keep in mind. Of course, there are no like. Uh, I don't know, very comprehensive studies on Putin's personality, but maybe the leadership literature might help us understand what are the determinants behind his, what seems to us as irrational behaviors. Today, there was a meeting in Antalya, in Turkey, where the Russian and the Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs were in the Antalya Diplomacy Forum, and where um, you know, some an analysts said that you know, Lavrov um, in that meeting was very moderate uh, and if he was like trying to give some promises to the Ukrainian side, at least to the international community that, okay, we will ease down, but, you know, the, the experts, I'm not an expert on Russia, the experts uh, in, like in CNN and in, in the Turkish media, some people just, uh, you know, said uh, it's not something that Lauro can decide or like the, 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 all the, you know, the diplomatic corp or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs can take a decision. It is actually uh, just what Putin decides. 
in, in, you know, in, in a very authoritarian way. So, and this is something that is not that different to us, uh, that's new to us, I suppose. This is, this is what, I mean, my observations at least. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, uh, may, may I, I think uh, to try to explain the situation by just focusing on uh, individual psychological uh, uh, concepts and ideas that does not lead us anywhere. Uh, uh, Putin is not an original thinker, so out of himself, uh, he doesn't uh, really develop uh, a scenario uh, uh, and, and other kind of uh, 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 ideas uh, of what uh, he, uh, as, as Putin, wants to, to do. However, I think it is quite obvious that uh, Putin is a nationalist. I mean, he uh, argues, uh, at least if we uh, take serious what he writes and, and talks about, what he argues is there are Russians in the Ukraine, uh, there are Russians uh, in, uh, in, in some Georgian uh, uh, sites, there are Russians in the Crim Crimea, etc. And these Russians have to be gotten home, I mean, so to speak, in his ideas. So he's a nationalist and he wants to uh, 